Hey, Dee, have you ever heard of a moss piglet? Uh, no. Well, they sound pretty cute, don't they? Kinda. Well, I'm going to talk more about them later in the podcast. Get us started, Dee. I'm kind of excited. Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on seven and a half acres out in the country because I'm crazy. And I'm Carol Michael from Minneapolis, Indiana. I have a suburban garden measured in square feet, about a third of an acre. I'm clearly the same one here. <laughs> we call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we really want you to love it too. Yes, we do. We aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How does your garden grow? My garden grows really well, but let me tell you, I got some, I saw something this morning that I want from my garden. Ooh, what is it? Because I'll probably want it too. <laughs> Maybe not. I went to- I went to the dentist this morning to have my teeth cleaned, and out the window, they have like a bird feeding station. Yeah. They had the cutest little miniature picnic table, and I'm talking like all of six inches tall and a foot wide, and they put a spike with a thing of corn on it, and then squirrels come and sit at the table and eat, and she said it is so cute, and I'm like, well, if you don't get a webcam on that, I'm going to have to get one for my garden. Don't you think I need one, Dee? Yeah, you go right ahead. I do not want to attract squirrels to my bird feeders, but you go right ahead. <laughs> you lost me at miniature picnic table, and then the idea of, although I want to see it. I want to see what it looks like. Well, I, I'm sure that if you did an online search, you'd come up with them. I bet, I bet Rural King has them. I am going to, I am either going to make one or buy one. I'm, anyway, my garden grows really well, Dee. Let's get around to gardening. Okay. Tell me about it. Uh, I declare that it is a great year for strawberries and a great year for lettuce, picking both every single day. My strawberries have never been as big and as delicious as they are right now. I saw a picture on Instagram and I thought to myself, this is a good year for your garden for strawberries. And lettuce here has bolted. But and it's bitter because I tasted it yesterday. But uh, that's after okay. today, it might bolt and be bitter here too. Yeah, bummer. So I'm very pleased to report that all the seeds have been sown in the vegetable garden. I had to weed like a fiend so I could get my zinnias and marigolds and sunflowers planted. But zucchini, uh, cucumbers, beans, corn, all that's been planted. I was putting that last cucumber seed in the ground, and they were. Singing back home again in Indiana at the Indiana five Indianapolis five hundred on yes. Sunday. So I guess my new goal won by Mr. Erickson because Jimmy Jordan had a crash. I saw it on the news this morning. Well, you know more yeah, about I the know race you, than I do. I know you don't care. <laughs> I I listened to the beginning because I gotta hear him sing back home again in Indiana. Anyway. One of the sunflowers I planted, I was going through my seed stash, and it's a new variety called Concert Bells. All America Selection sent it to us. Did they send you some seeds? Not of this variety, no. Okay, Dee, I'm going to read you this description at the risk of getting everybody irritated because I don't think you can actually go to the store and buy them. Not yet. Concert Bells puts on a quite a performance with a unique flower presentation of multiple clusters of 10 to 12 flowers on an erect columnar stem. That's exciting. That's a lot of flowers for a sunflower. Yes. Yes. It grows about five to six feet and they were growing it under adverse conditions and multiple judges said it was very durable, very sturdy through strong winds and rains and dark of night. And so anyway. So let's all make a note, all of us who didn't get the seed, that we might need concert bell, concert bells next year and you're going to report back to us and tell us yes because i'm going to remember to report back because all america selections will like me to report back as well so i'm excited yeah we should talk about that just for a second so like everybody's different who sends you plants or sends you seeds what i love about all american selections and national garden bureau is that they send you a little survey 
at the end of the season. And you and I go on there and vote for all of the stuff they sent us. And, you know, even if I don't grow a particular variety of something, I can just say not applicable. But I can tell them about germination rate and everything else. And it's all laid out there for me. I love that. And when Burpee used to send us stuff, one of the things I loved about them is that they sent their placard telling us about the vegetables they were sending laminated. Because when you're in the garden, because all this stuff comes at once, and I know now our listeners are going, oh, poor you, poor you. But it does all come at once, right, Carol? Yes, yes. And (laughs) guess what, Dee? Poor you, but great for me. Burpee sent me vegetable plants, and I got the laminated card, and I am growing a cherry tomato that I'm really super excited about that is called Sun Dipper. And it's kind of like, I would call it an elongated pear shape, so it's got like a little handle so you won't double dip in your dip. Oh, that's cute. What a cute idea. Well, those will be available in a year or two, probably. If they've sent them out for you guys to trial, and they haven't, Burpee hasn't sent me anything lately. What's wrong with you, Burpee? But anyway, um, when we get this stuff, it all comes at one time. Sometimes it comes very disheveled in the plant section because they're shipping out so much stuff and UPS or FedEx, you know, messes it up. So I love the fact that they make it easy for us to report. Exactly. Anyway, and the other thing, when this podcast episode drops tomorrow, yes. June the 1st, yes, will mark six years since I retired from my corporate IT job. And look at the smile on her face. You all can just imagine it. Congratulations, Carol. I'm really glad that you retired because we get to talk more. That's right. Now tell me about your garden. Oh my gosh, I worked so hard in the garden this week, especially Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I took off Monday and worked in the house so hard because it was windy. I mean, it was so windy that even I couldn't stand it. Um, So Friday, I'm going to break down the days. Friday, Bill and I rebuilt the sidewalk that washed away next to the garage. This is the second time we've rebuilt it this year. We had a mole problem. And we finally, with that five inches of rain, it showed the entire trench. And so Bill brought in all of this soil to put back into the trench so my backyard doesn't look real great right now, but that's just life. And then next to it, we rebuilt the sidewalk. Um, and that's not easy. It's a brick sidewalk, and we had to put in more sand, and it was it's a long story, but Bill and I got it done. And then um, we filled in. So we already had topsoil in the upper pasture. That's why we were able to do that so fast. And we have a tractor. Right. Then on Saturday, I bought more of the Landscapers Mix Mulch, which you can find at Lowe's. It's Happy Glow, uh, H-A-P-I-G-L-O. And it is wonderful stuff because it is um, shredded pine bark. But it's the little tiny pine bark pieces. Like each one of them is maybe a quarter inch. So when you put that on top as mulch, it doesn't impede seeds entirely unless you put it on pretty thick. But the worms work it down in the soil really fast, and that's one of the secrets to good soil. Um, so Saturday I bought more of that for the tiered borders cause they needed some and I dug out tons of Rebecca Goldstone. I filled two big carts full. Oh yeah. To get down to my compost pile and it likes to take over here. I'm not saying it's a bad plant. It's just not, it's not a good plant here in its place. I'm going to plant Will's wonderful mums. I actually was out there with my spade when you texted me and said you were ready to record. Cool. So they're all placed and ready to go. Um, Will's Wonderful also is a spreader, which I'm going to write about this week on the blog because I already have it partially done, but it's really easy to pull up. But let me just, let me just say something to you and to our listeners. Last week you said you had no place for Will's Wonderful Moms. This week suddenly you got places for Will's Wonderful Moms. I told you. Because I, because I dug out a ton of gold sturm. (laughs) Well, I I told you. I more to dig out. I told you you have room. Yeah. Okay. I wish you were here to help me dig it all out. All right, no, I wish you were here on, to help me weed. Yeah, well, I'm not. In spirit. Then on Sunday, I um, had a, we had late mass because it was Father Novak, our, our priest. It was his 25th anniversary on Sunday. Congratulations, Father Novak. Um, we had a late mass. And so that morning, I weeded the cut flower garden beds and moved some of the zinnias around. And that's made me think, I may start the zinnias indoor next spring the way I did with the nasturtiums. Because we have those really hard rains in early spring, and I live on a little bit of a hill on that side. Right, and so right. all the seed rushed down. So I ended up replanting the dumb things anyway. 
And it, they might do better if I start them indoors and stay where they're put so that I know what color they are and stuff. Um, let's see. I also moved some of the sunflower seedlings around in the potage, and that made them very unhappy, but I don't think they're going to die. They'll they'll snap out of it eventually. And, um, yeah, I still haven't planted the shrubs. They're on the north side of the house, and I just keep watering them. So we, the end. we should start a little pool of some kind, like, when do you think that Dee will actually plant the shrubs? I'm going with late fall, because I know you don't plant stuff in the summertime in Oklahoma. No, it'll probably be fall. It'll probably be September. But you know what? That's the good thing. They're all in five-gallon containers, two and a half and five gallon. Uh So they'll be fine on the north side of the house as long as I water them. And actually it gives them more time for their roots to develop. Because these shrubs are not like the ones you buy at the box store, which are already root bound. These are cuttings he took. and Okay. They're they're slow. All right. Okay. Not your first rodeo. I believe you. Thanks. I appreciate that because sometimes I get out there and I go, you'd think it was my first rodeo. (laughs) All right. Here is our first quote. There is nothing like the first hot day of spring when the gardener stops wondering if it's too soon to plant the dahlias and starts wondering if it's too late. Even the most beautiful weather will not allay the gardener's notion, well-founded actually, that he is somehow too late, too soon, or that he has not too much stuff going on or not enough. And that's from Henry Mitchell, (laughs) the famous gardener columnist for the Washington Post, 1923 to 1993. That's when he lived, not when he wrote, but passed away in 1993. One of the best garden writers that ever wrote. Exactly. <laughs> so. everybody, everybody bows down to Henry Mitchell. So this week, because of you, we are going to talk about true lilies. These are not to be confused with daylilies. Daylilies are Hemerocallus species. True lilies are lilium. 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 So the first one we want to talk about is the Asiatic lilies. Dee's trying to keep from laughing. These are the easiest to grow, as you noted. And they they grow maybe a foot, 18 inches tall. No, they grow taller than that, too. They come in all sizes. Asiatic lilies can go from a foot all the way up to, I'd say, three feet. And um, I have several in my garden. And these are the ones that you always see around Easter at the box store. And they are not Easter lilies. They are Asiatic lilies. And you know because they have horizontal leaves. Yes. And I don't like them. You don't like them? I think. Why do you not like them? Well, I think they look like plastic. And they just, and it's probably the way people plant them around here. They just kind of plop them in the middle of a landscape bed. There's nothing around them. And I'm like, they just look fake to me. And I'm like, I don't like them. I don't like them. So the ones I do like are the ones that have really cool coloring. And there's two in particular. Forever Susan is a wonderful lily. And um, I was just thinking of one of my clients, Susan. And Susan came over and she showed me she had planted Forever Susan, which I loved. And I said, I grew that one too. It's beautiful. It has orange and then it has kind of a dark, dark purple in the center. Uh And then there's Lionheart which is yellow with a dark, dark center. You, you see a pattern here? I do. Dark, dark center. Because a lot of them have that, okay? So then, but the best one, the best one on the planet, in my opinion, is evening sunset. And evening sunset is really tall and is the most beautiful shade of pink and orange together, but mostly pink. It looks like a sunset. And it is worth growing anywhere, and I think even you would like it because it doesn't have it doesn't even look like an Asiatic lily. I will have a look see at it, and then I will decide. But the next category that I was going to say, if you're going to grow these, the best thing to do is not buy them in pots at the box store. Just order the lilies in the fall like you would any other lily, because if you order them from a company, you're just going to get a really good bulb. I guess it's a bulb. And you get it, and you get them in October, and you plant them. But go ahead. Next, trumpet lilies. Trumpet lilies, very beautiful. I don't think of them as having a lot of scent, but that no. I, I think of the Madonna lily, the Easter lilies that we get. So you know those are two different those are two different species, the Madonna lily and the Easter lily. And I think people get confused because everything you see in ch- church windows, stained glass windows, is the Madonna lily. And it's almost always shown, if you're Catholic, it's shown with the Virgin because 
It's a symbol of her virginity, usually when the angel Gabriel comes to see her. And it's usually with Mary in all various times throughout her life, okay? So here's the problem. The Madonna lilies have an issue, and so nobody grows them anymore. I mean, you never find them anywhere. So we have substituted Easter lilies, which if I'm remembering right, Easter lily is Lilium longiflorum, I think. Um, but anyway, they're fine. You can grow, actually, you can grow those in Oklahoma. Like you can take them home from your church after Easter, put them in the ground and they'll come back. But I think they're kind of ugly and I only like them at Easter. They do smell good. So. Well, I, I replant them in the garden just because it just seems like the thing to do. I was going to say that our friends at Old House Gardens, I was looking at their lilies this morning. Mm -hmm. They have the Madonna lily, Lilium candidum. Yeah. You can actually buy it from them. And I kind of should have stayed away from that lily page. I haven't bought anything yet, but, you know, the temptation is right there. It is. I'm not going to grow the Madonna lily. It has too many problems. I'm not saying that theirs have problems, but it's had a lot of problems, so I would not grow it. Okay, let's move on. Then there's the flora, well, the tiger lily, which is Lilium lancifolium. And the tiger lily, the one you and I both grow, is flora plano, which is the doubled one. Flora plano means lots of petals, I think. And so are lots yeah, of it flowers, does. something like that. So it's the double, it has double petals, and that's why it's called that. It's very pretty. I mean, you know, it's orange and black, orange and purple, really. Yeah, it's a typical tiger lily. And I uh, had one growing back in the vegetable garden in a dumb spot. And so I dug up some of it and gave it to my sister last summer when it was in full bloom. I figured her grandkids would like it at her house. And then more came up. So I just moved those yesterday. So we'll see what happens. And then I have them in another spot. Yeah, if you grow tiger lilies, you'll probably always have them. And let, as long as you grow them in soil that's well-drained. That's true. So then there's the Formosa lily, which actually Steve sells that at Bustani. And I have some of it, and it's pretty. I w I'm not going to say I love it. It's okay. And I, I'm going to say that I don't even know if I have them, because I have a lot of different lilies that I bought, because the uh, owner of Souls Gardens down the street from me, down the road, I guess, mm -hmm. He, in addition to hostas and day lilies, he got into these fancy lilies, and I've bought yeah. some of them. And he's really into the next category, the orange pets, which are the hybrids yep. between. This is my favorite. My favorite, too. The, the hybrid between an oriental and a trumpet lily. And this is where you said last week that you had this uh, Sher Sherazad. Say that word for Scheherazade. me. Scheherazade. Scheherazade. And I didn't know what he, that was. It's just a variety of an orange pet. I'm like, oh, I have those. And I acted like last year, last week, I hadn't any idea what you were talking about. Well, and you didn't know who Scheherazade was. Scheherazade is just the queen in the Arabian Nights. We're really a thousand and one nights is the actual name of it. But in the United States, it's called the Arabian Nights. Very famous tales. Aladdin's lamp is in there. Um, oh gosh, there are so many. Anyway, the, I love Arabian Nights and I love the story of Scheherazade. Basically, she was at a, she was kind of married. To, well, she wasn't kind of married to an abuser. She was married to an abuser. And his thing was he was going to kill her every night, but she would tell him a story. And then it would keep him, you know, it would keep him occupied until the next night. She would do a cliffhanger. So I always think of her as one of the very, like, you know, if, if she were a saint, she'd be the patron saint of writers. Serial writers. <laughs> there you go. So I do not have that one. I have several other ones, but I don't know the names of them, I'm sad to say. But they are some of my favorites. Um, and I'm going to link to the Old House Gardens because they have... A couple of them there. Mm -hmm. They also have another lily, the original American Turk's cap lily, which is a native. Right. Lilium superbum. Right. Or superbum. Superbum. <laughs> superbum. <laughs> which is also, I have that one. It's very pretty. One more thing I'm going to say about Scheherazade. I grow a lot of Orion pets in my garden. Well, about five right now. Some of them fade away. Um, Scheherazade has been going on strong for 10 years now. She does not fade away. I could give away, you know, plants 
I mean, little baby plants. She's very, very strong, and she smells really good, and she grows six feet tall. So a great plant. That sounds really nice. And I used to think I would say about the orange pet lilies, mm-hmm. they're easy to tuck into the garden, and they don't really take up a lot of space, wide space, so they'll just kind of show up. And I'm planting them in between, kind of a little bit behind, where I have a big thing of uh, peonies. Mm-hmm. And then you've got something to look at when the peonies are all done blooming. And That's a great and idea. summer That's a great idea. Midsummer, here come the lilies. And uh, we should mention lily beetle real quick. Lily beetle is a huge mm-hmm. problem. Back What a downer. I know, but do you, do you even have them? Do you have lily beetles? I I don't know if we do or not. Well, you would we know. Do. You would know. They're bright, bright orange. I mean, there's no I don't think them. I have them. They're really pretty. Creepy little things. Anyway, lily lily beetles are a huge problem back east. I know they're, they were a problem in Buffalo when we went to visit in Buffalo. Um, you have to hand pick them. There's a lot of stuff you have to do. They're also in England, but right now they're not in Oklahoma. So rejoice and plant lilies because they might come someday. Rejoice and plant lilies here because I I don't think we have them. I hope not. Want me to do the next quote? Please. If we persist, I do not doubt that by age 96 or so, we will all have gardens we are pleased with, more or less. Henry Mitchell. <laughs> that one's great. This this reminds me of that bed by my garage. I'm actually going to write a blog post and go through all the iterations of that in the past 25 years. But I think that's great. Now it's the pink bed and you kind of like it, right? I kind of like it right now. Good. Our vegetable is not a vegetable. It's another berry fruit. This time we're going to talk about raspberries. And here's what I got to say about raspberries, Dee. Okay. Nobody overcomplicates raspberries like a bunch of gardeners like you and I. When you start talking about all the pruning, it just gets to be like most people just roll their eyes and say, uh-uh, I'm not doing it. It's, com- <laughs> it's not that complicated. As long as you know a couple of key facts. Okay, tell us, well, first tell us about what we're actually talking about. We're talking about Rubus ideus, and that can be both red or golden. And if yes. and I have one thing to say about raspberries. If I'm going to grow raspberries, I'm growing the golden ones, because you can't buy those. That is true. I mean, maybe you can if you live in Washington State, but in Oklahoma, I have, I have yet to see a golden raspberry. I had a friend, Katie, who grew them here. Did quite well, and she always had golden raspberries, and I was very envious. Okay, now, tell people about the two things that they need to know. First of all, they need to know that raspberries are briars, and so mm-hmm. they will spread, and they will sucker, and, you know, a tip hits the ground, it'll root, and you can have a big, massive jumble of plant without some... Yes, you can. ...some judicious pruning, and then... That's the next thing we would need to tell them is there are actually two kinds of raspberries. There's the kind that fruits just once, and then there's the kind that they call quote unquote ever bearing, which means you'll get raspberries in June ish time frame, and you'll get Mm -hmm. raspberries in August y, September ish time frame. You'll just get two sets of raspberries. They're not really ever bearing. It's sort of like strawberries. Yeah, it's not they're, like you're getting them every yeah. day, all summer long. I mean, really, yeah. that would be, that's a lot to ask of a plant. Yes. So, how do you prune them, Carol? Complicated. Okay, so this is where it gets complicated until, until people remember one key fact. One, one stem coming up from the ground is biennial. So the first year it comes up, it's not going to fruit. The second year it's going to come up, it'll fruit. And so you want to cut back, like after the spring fruiting, you want to cut those back Mm -hmm. just about in half that fruited. And then that'll grow and that'll fruit again because that's the everbearing part. And then you also want to do some pruning out in early, early spring, you know, about the time you're pruning apples and stuff, you want to get rid of dead canes and you want to get rid of canes that may be fruited at the end of the year and you can see the little 
uh, the the mm-hmm. skeletons of the blooms and stuff. You want to cut those out because those aren't going to bloom again, or they're not going to bloom and flower. Right, because you because do, you don't want those stems sucking away energy from the plant because they don't do anything except for grow and become a tangled mess because right. they are thorny little boogers or prickly, really. They're not really thorns. They're actually prickles, I think, just like um, roses, but doesn't matter. The point is they hurt. Oh, yeah, we forgot to mention the thorns, the pricklies. <laughs> and so as with most things, raspberries like the sun and they like well-drained soil. And so if you have a raised bed, you can actually grow a little stand of raised berries in raised berries, raspberries in a raised bed. They would. I was thinking that's fine. Raised berries works. So I will admit I grew some raspberries for a year or two, but I did not do a good job of managing the the bed of them. And they mm-hmm. were not in the greatest soil and they didn't really kind of they didn't really take hold. Okay. And so I thought, oh, this was another good idea that wasn't such a good idea. So out they went. But I would be willing to try them again. I'm not. And so Dee's like, eh, go for it, Carol. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I have more to take care of now than I know what to do with. So I don't need anything else. I think next week we should talk about goji berries. We can. I know nothing about goji berries. So that would be the perfect, that's, that's the perfect topic. <laughs> Great. We will talk about them next time. So that's so I will also say that raspberries love a uh, love compost. They love compost and they would love for you to put it all over them and plant it around them and yeah, cuz they kind of like a rich, not super rich soil, but they really like a good aerated soil. So I am not growing raspberries. I'll just envy my friends raspberries. Yeah, the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure to wash your berries really good because spider mites, I always seem to have spider mites and things on them. So wash them really good. Soak them in water, drain the water, soak them in water, drain the water. And these are making all kinds of faces. Yeah. Soak them real good and get, you know, let the little critters go away. <laughs> I think I'll just eat raspberries from the store with chocolate. We- we have convinced nobody to grow raspberries, to eat. No, no, we haven't. But you know what? Maybe we've saved some brand new gardener from thinking, yeah, I need every, because that's what happens when you're new. You think I need blackberries and raspberries and elderberries and goji berries. And yeah, you do not need all those things. Start with one. Yeah. I might grow raspberries again. I grow You golds. go for it. All right. I'm going to do the next quote. Almost any garden, if you see it at just the right moment, can be confused with paradise. Also Henry Mitchell. I'll say this about Henry Mitchell. He's absolutely right. And all those magazines I used to read all those years, you you begin to think there's something wrong with you because your garden doesn't look that way. Ha. Huh. Those are taken on a really, really good day. <laughs> Very carefully taken. So our book this week is called mm-hmm. Garden Allies. The Insects, Birds, and Other Animals That Keep Your Garden Beautiful and Thriving by, and I'm sorry to mess up her name, Frederique Lavoie-Pierre. Lavoie-Pierre. Illustrations by, illustrations by Craig Lutker. sounds pretty good. This D is a most interesting book. I will hold it up so you can see the cover. I don't have it, so she's got to talk about it. Go for it, Carol. Tell us. And so... It says insects, birds, and other animals. I will tell you that it is probably 90% insects. Okay. And it starts off with microscopic organisms, and that is what a moss piglet is. (laughs) It's a microscopic eight-legged creature that looks a little like, they said, a bear, and so it has the common name of water bear or moss piglet. Huh. And the actual... It's actually what they call a tardigrade, which I had never heard of. And it's found in soil and moss and lawns, and it feeds on protozoa and other little organisms, including like nematodes. Um, They have the ability to shut themselves down and then reanimate themselves years later. Mm -hmm. And so, Dee, you know I don't have any pets, but I think I'm going to get a little vial, put a little speck of dirt in it, and tell people, you know, you want to see my moss piglet? (laughs) You're crazy. <laughs> That's my new pet. My new pet moss piglet. 
Anyway, I'll tell you, D, I'm, I'm through the chapter with the moss piglet and heading on down. This book is full of really good information, and it's, it's written in a very interesting manner. So the author says, read it from the front to the back. You're tempted to, like, go to the chapter on wasp or the chapter on spiders. Not Some people aren't, but... Um, a lot of she says read it through because she kind of builds on information as she goes. And so I am going to read it through in order. Um, and I think I will thoroughly enjoy it. So I have a question. If, yes. Who is she, this lady that wrote this book? So she is uh, an author and she's up there in the Seattle, Washington area. Okay. And I think they said she'd written a column for the is it Pacific Northwest magazine, Pacific Gardener? What's that magazine up there? Mm. Uh, I don't, I used to, Pacific Horticulture was what it was at the time. Yeah. I don't even yeah. know if it's still around. She's written a column for them. So she's been around a long time. And uh, this is, I'm, this is a keeper, D. I really am going to enjoy this book. So if you're interested in learning more about insects in your garden, if you, didn't take entomology in college or like me, it was so long ago, you've forgotten everything. This is a great book to pick up and read. It's, and, you know, I'll be reading it for a while because it's not a thin book. So, no, it'll take you a while. But I see you've marked a bunch of pages, which I love. Um, it said You said in here, plus once you read this, I'm pretty sure you won't pick up an insecticide for your garden ever again. And I mean that in a good way, not a preachy way. Yeah. So the more we understand the more we do the right thing. Maya Angelou said that. <laughs> yeah. Garden Allies, the Insects, Birds, and Other Animals that Keep Your Garden Beautiful and Thriving by Frederique Lavoie-Pierre. Illustrations by Chris Latker. That's our book. Ready for the next quote? I am. There are no green thumbs or black thumbs. There are only gardeners and non-gardeners. Gardeners are the ones who ruin after ruin get on with the high defiance of nature herself, creating in the very face of her chaos and tornado, the bower of roses and the pride of irises. It sounds very well to garden in a natural way. You may see the natural way in any desert, any swamp, any leech-filled laurel hell. Defiance, on the other hand, is what makes gardeners. Henry Mitchell. Okay, so you picked the, all of these quotes today, and that's a really funny quote coming after your insect book where we're not going to ever pick up stuff again that hurts anything. Well, <laughs> I'm, what I'm saying is, what I ter- Henry Mitchell's not saying we're going to like nuke our garden so there's no pest. He's saying... Some of us do. He's saying, you know, like, I think he would think that's like no mo may that we talked about last year where you just let everything go natural... That's not really gardening. Two weeks ago. But, you know, planting out a beautiful rose bed or a perennial garden or whatever, that is defiance of nature. That's what he's talking about. I agree. That's what he's talking about. I agree. But, but yeah, I mean, it comes down to perseverance. That's right. Are you willing to persevere? And, um, yeah, I've done this long enough that I pretty much am. Willing to persevere. Exactly. And people, I show people my mistakes too. I'm like, well, this didn't work. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So the dirt this week is brought to us by Amy, my, my BFF. And she laughs that she's my, I used to call her my non gardening best friend, Amy, but she has houseplants now. So she can't be called that anymore. So she caught, she was with us at a meeting and she said, what is the deal with the new name for beans? And I was like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I went and did some research. It's not a new name, but apparently the millennials are calling them by this name instead of by beans sometimes. They're calling them pulses, P-U-L-S-E-S. So you did find an article. Yeah, like your pulse. You found a nice <laughs> yeah. article. And I'm like, huh? Why don't we just call them what they are? Right. Beans, peas, <laughs> legumes. Yeah. I I was really really surprised, and I but it turns out that the little bean inside of the pod, or the little pea inside of the pod, is a pulse. That's a botanical yes. name. Who, who knew? knew? Those smart millennials. That's who. I guess. <laughs> 
I guess. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So it's a very distinct meaning. A legume refers to any plant from the fabace. How do you Fabaceae. say Fabaceae. Fabaceae. Fabaceae family that would include leaves, stems, and pods. A pulse is the edible seed from a legume plant. Pulses include beans, lentils, and peas. And I want to know from our listeners, did did they know they were called pulses? Because I sure did. I don't know that. Now, if somebody says, do you have any pulses? Or I can't. Let's, let's think of the use of it in a sentence. Hey, D, are you going to mix up a big batch of pulses today? No, it doesn't work. It just doesn't really no, work. No. no. So, and no, I'm actually not going to grow beans today either. But I do love beans ever since I found Rancho Gordo. So let's move on to our rabbit holes. What's your rabbit hole? So, Dee, I told you I was, I've was i discovered the Aunt Dimity mysteries. Yes. And so I said I wasn't going to read them in order. I decided I should read them in order. So they are easy reads. One of them takes about three hours to read. And I have read through the first six yeah. since our last podcast episode. And I've only stopped because the seventh book, some monster has it checked out from the library, the Kindle version. So I have to wait. It says it's approximately two weeks whenever they return it. I guess it's due from then in two weeks. So it's on hold. Mm-hmm. So I... Have it on hold. I went ahead and checked out books 8, 9, 10, and 11. So this isn't going to happen again. In the meantime, though, I will say that it has given me the opportunity to crack open next week's book, which is also very, very good. And yes, that is a teaser. Good job. So you said this morning when we talked, you said you don't have a rabbit hole yet. And I had to think about it. Oh, yes, I do. I do have a rabbit hole. It is. I see your rabbit hole. (laughs) It is the Chelsea Flower Show on BritBox. You can watch. um, They did a whole series through Gardener's World where all the different hosts come on and they take one, you know, of each day of the Chelsea Flower Show, which was last week. I have been sitting down and they're an hour and a half piece. I mean, what other country would have this much gardening on every single night, right? No, no. Yeah, yeah. And if you subscribe to BritBox, you can sit and watch them at your leisure. So this afternoon when I eat lunch, I will be sitting down and watching them. And I want to tell you one thing I learned on... What did you learn, Dee? Yesterday's episode. So there is this... There, it's a family that grows um, tulips. That's what they do. And they sell tulip bulbs to people in the fall. And they grow them right in England. And they bring 30,000 tulips to the Chelsea Flower Show and manage to make them open perfectly in time for the show. And do you want to know how they do that, Carol? Wow, I do. They pick the bulbs when they're, you know, that moment when your tulip is closed, but you can see just color on the edges. Okay. Yes. They pick them then with their leaves. They lay them in paper that doesn't, it's not newspaper, but it looks like newsprint, like the paper before it's printed. Right. They lay it in this paper. They wrap them unwatered in this paper, and then they put them in a cold storage area, and then they check all 30,000 every other day to make sure they aren't rotting, okay? So they keep them in this cold storage area, not freezing, just cold enough. Just it's They said two degrees, which whatever that is in Fahrenheit. So they go in there and they check each bundle every other day. And this, this starts three weeks before. All right, they keep them that way. And then the day of the show, the day that it's going to be done, they take those tulips and they plunge them into water because they dry out to where they're almost silk. He said, he said they're like, they feel like silk and they look like silk, like a tapestry. So then they stick them in water, they suck up the water immediately and they bloom open. It is the most wow. amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that is kind of how I do the peonies, which kind I can't of, yeah. do now because they've all bloomed out. That's kind of the same thing, except I can't imagine 30,000, but you would have to have help for that. Yes, their whole family does it, and um, they take great pride in it. And then they also plant, uh, well, they don't plant them. They give or sell 45,000 bulbs 
to um, a garden nearby so that people can see them in the garden setting and in the showcase setting. And this isn't, this isn't to like win awards. They bring them because they're bulb sellers. Very nice. And one they talked about that I have never seen before, and I actually wrote my friend Jamie Ashmore, and he hasn't written me back, but um, it's called Texas Gold. So everybody look up Texas Gold. That's a very interesting tool. Texas Gold. I will have to look that up. Well, and you'll be, we'll be inundated if you, like, I watch YouTubes and stuff. There'll be all kinds of YouTubes and stuff popping up about the Queen's Jubilee celebrations taking place this week. That's a big deal in yes, England. Thursday. Huge big yes. parties going on for that. Well, 70 God years bless the Queen. The I'm telling you. Whether you like her or don't, you have to admire the way she's stuck with it all. Who doesn't like the Queen? I mean, they may not want the royalty anymore, some of them, but goodness, she's been a stalwart, stalwart person. Henry V would think a lot of her. I believe that he would. And so I will be checking out some of those YouTube videos and things about the Queen's Jubilee. I think that'll be very, very interesting. So let's move on to garden commissions. Dee, what you doing this week? You wrote on the show notes you were going to plant those shrubs. We already talked about you're not planting those shrubs. I'm not planting those shrubs. The (laughs) ground's going to be too hard. I thought maybe if I could get them in today before the rains come tonight, that'd be awesome. But that isn't going to happen. I got too much to do today. So I have... I have three daylilies I bought last year that really need to go in the ground, and they need to go in. You're really supposed to plant daylilies in April and September, so I'm getting ready to move those pots back over next to the shrubs. Um, And I want to say, I normally don't do this, where I have this much stuff that I need to plant. I normally get all planted. I just can't decide. Well, anyway, those are my excuses. All right, I need to pull out my lettuce that's bolted. Boo. I bolted too fast, and I'm really sad about it, but that's okay. You could leave your lettuce to flower for the bees because a lot of people do. Yep. I will not be doing that because I really want to do my sunflower thing. And I've got the sunflower seeds already planted. And I need to move a few more plants around and keep them well watered before I go out of town. So I want to see those sunflowers. So I'm going to pull it. And that. Very nice. And I'm going to, and I already said, I'm going to plant that Will's Wonderful. I also have a frost flower that I'm going to plant. Those will be fine. And then. Uh, two salvias. That's what I'm doing today. I moved a big clump of daylilies yesterday because, again, it's in this border, which is really where the zinnias go. And I thought, you know, I must have at one time thought I was going to do perennials back there. But I moved that thing yesterday. and I thought, you know what? Live or die. It's up to you, plant. They'll be fine in your climate. It's just our climate gets so hot and you have to shade them and stuff. So, they do fine in pots, and I'll just – and that way I can watch them bloom because some of their tags blew away. It's a long story. <laughs> I know. So I have a couple of emerald towers, basils to plant. I have the containers. They have the last of some violas, so out they go and in go the emerald towers. I also have this old wheelbarrow that I sometimes just leave on its side and – like call it a garden sculpture. <laughs> and sometimes I put it upright like this year and I planted a bunch of pansies in it. Big surprise. <laughs> they are on their way out. And so I thought, huh, I need to go back to the garden center, the greenhouse apparently, because I need to put something in there. Yeah. So I'll do that. And then I got to do some shrub pruning, some bed edging, continuous weeding, deadheading, watching my garden grow. You know, when this drops, it's June the 1st, and it is like full tilt gardening season, collective sigh that everything's planted that really absolutely wanted to be planted. Right. Collective sigh that if we had a frost now, it'd be, you know, like an apocalypse. It's not going to happen. And uh, just going to spend those hour a day here, an hour a day tomorrow, an hour a day the next day. And do I, what I can. I thought of one more thing. We need to Chelsea chop or Indianapolis 500 chop. It's time. You remember uh, we were going to yeah, talk. It's about that time here. Yeah. We were going to talk about that. And then, um, so I did. So everybody start chopping back your perennials in both our climates because they're starting to grow really tall. The asters are getting ridiculous and just a lot of things. So cut those back now, but don't, but I like what you said at the very end of this. So you need to say that. What did I say at the very end of it? You said, this is definitely the time of year to remember to just go out and do something for an hour or so. Do not put too much pressure on yourself to garden until you drop. 
That's right. Good advice. Thank you. And with that, we want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. Also, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything. And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd really appreciate a five-star review. It helps us get noticed by others because it all works on an algorithm. Could you also share our podcast with with your gardening friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And now when I go places, I tell everybody we have a podcast. Everybody. Yeah, that's a good idea. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, use the affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Goodbye, everybody.